Good morning, everyone. I'm Graham Reside. I'm the director of the Cal Turner Program, and we are hosting uh, this breakfast. Um, I want to uh, take an opportunity to introduce uh, our speaker in a moment, but first I thought I would um, begin with a couple of poems. Um, uh, but before I do that, I'd like to uh, invite you all to um, be sure that you're on our mailing list if you enjoy this breakfast. We do these uh, fairly regularly. Our next one is scheduled March 20th, and Bill Ballette will be um, presenting at that uh, breakfast. That will be at the Divinity School, so uh, keep uh, an eye out for that. Um, okay, this, this poem just grabbed me. It came to my inbox, and I thought I would share it with you. It may just be a statement about my life, but uh, I'm hoping uh, that it somehow resonates with you. It's called We Are Running by Lucille Clifton. We are running. Running, and time is clocking us from the edge like an only daughter. Our mothers stream before us, cradling their breasts in their hands. Oh, pray that what we want is worth this running. Pray that what we are running towards is worth this want. I'll introduce uh, our speaker, and then I'll read the second poem, if that's OK. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you um, Professor Walter Fluker. Uh, Walter is uh, an old friend of Vanderbilt's, and I've known of him for a long time, and we met probably seven or eight years ago. Uh, the occasion for um, Walter's uh, presence with us today is, is that he recently published, it was uh, last year about this time, a book called Ethical Leadership, which came across my desk, and I was excited about it, and so um, got in contact with him, uh, and uh, he agreed to come and speak with us. Uh, it's called Ethical Leadership, The Quest for Character, Civility, and Community. We have some copies out there if you're interested. Uh, I recommend the book highly. Uh, Walter is the executive director of the Leadership Center at Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. He's also the Coca-Cola Professor of Leadership Studies and the editor of the Howard Thurman Papers Project. Uh, Walter has been thinking about and caring about issues of ethical leadership for a long time, and I'm uh, very grateful for uh, his presence with us. Thank you, Walter. Um, the last act of introduction will be uh, this poem called A Ritual to Read to Each Other by William Stafford. If you don't know the kind of person I am, and I don't know the kind of person you are, a pattern that others made may prevail in the world, and following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. For there is many a small betrayal in the mind, a shrug that lets the fragile sequence break, sending with shouts the horrible errors of childhood, storming out to play through the broken dike. And as elephants parade, holding each elephant's tail, but if one wanders, the circus won't find the park. I call it cruel, and maybe the root of all cruelty, to know what occurs but not recognize the fact. And so I appeal to a voice, to something shadowy, a remote, important region in all who talk. Though we could fool each other, we should consider, lest the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. For it is important that awake people be awake, or a breaking line may discourage them back to sleep. The signals we give, yes, no, maybe, these should be clear. The darkness around us is deep. So Walter, with that, I invite you to come up and be our elephant, at least for a little while. Take us a little closer to the park. Thank you. I bet you I really, oh, I should do this. That's why I do it for you. Thank you. Did I do it right? I need to put this up here somewhere. Up here for the mic, and this can be in my pocket or anywhere. But if I move around, I want it in my pocket, right? Good morning. I know that everyone is eating, and I'm aware that this is rather informal. Look at that good-looking guy. 
I haven't seen you since Cain slew Abel. It's wonderful to see you. It's always an act of faith to get on a plane and come, even if it only takes 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, and to have someone there waiting for you, uh, getting you in the car, especially if you've crossed the 50-yard line, uh, and making sure that you're assisted and that your memory doesn't fail you before you get to your hotel room. I'm so appreciative. And uh, very grateful for the uh, wonderful, wonderful time we had last night, a great fellowship at dinner. I'd like to do two things this morning uh, to really honor your presence for being uh, with us this morning. I'd like to tell you a little something about my story. Uh, when I think of leadership, I think in narrative. I think that um, the only way to think about leadership some days is to begin with your story. And storytelling becomes the very basis for the book that uh, Graham was talking about ethical leadership. Narrative-based ethics is the way I think about ethics. I'm sure there are a thousand ways to do ethics and many more ways to do leadership. Leadership is a lot like love. It's a many splintered and splendor thing. Uh, but I'm, I'm really interested in leadership from this narrative perspective. So first, I'd like to give you a little sense of how I arrived at the book. And two, I'd like to talk a little bit about the model you see up there and what that really kind of sort of means for me. I was uh, born in Mississippi. I was raised in Chicago. Uh, I'm a second generation immigrant from Mississippi. My daddy escaped Mississippi and raised us <laughs> on the south side of Chicago. And I talk about that in the very uh, introduction of the book. I found myself in, uh, I believe it was 1998 in Sierra Leone, uh, where uh, it was the first coup. But you know uh, what happened in that whole region of West Africa. Uh, I happened to be there uh, in staying in a bombed out hotel, the Solar Hotel, with a few officials from the World Health Organization. And I was there as a representative for the Ford uh, Foundation. But I was so struck looking at all of uh, the devastation, uh, the pain and social misery of the people I realized that I was standing at the intersection where worlds were colliding. And it also helped me to complete some of my own story because it reminded me of an earlier dream I'd had uh, not long before this visit to Sierra Leone. Uh, two people from my youth uh, from Chicago uh, had visited me in a dream. Uh, and it was the most vivid, I mean, realistic, surrealistic moment uh, I can imagine. Inky and Enola, they returned uh, from the past and they took me back to 43rd Street on the south side of Chicago and uh, asked me to remember my story. And I write about that in the introduction uh, because I had been on a very interesting journey. I had started out as a uh, an assistant pastor in Evanston, Illinois with Heisel Taylor. I was at Garrett and next thing I knew I was in Boston and they educated me in Boston and then I was at Dillard University in New Orleans and then I was at Vanderbilt and then I was back at Harvard and something was happening and it was like uh, T.S. Eliot said once, I was in the experience but I had missed the meaning and I was really moving too fast. And I really crashed. I crashed. That year at Harvard was one of the most incredible uh, moments for me. It was 1990 through 91. And I discovered also that if you write anything on Harvard stationery, people will respond to you. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, and so I was invited to all of these uh, affairs. And one affair that I want to name in particular, two actually, and then uh, kind of fill out this story for you. Um, I was invited to a Ford Foundation meeting in Georgetown, and it was the most interesting thing. And you should know I'm very weird. I do Howard Thurman. Uh, uh, you're weird, too. You just might not be aware of it. But I'd had a dream that day. I'd had a, a strange dream. Uh, and I left, and I went to Georgetown, and I'm in a meeting, and uh, the dream played out. I'll just share that, that with you. And someone introduced me to somebody who introduced me to somebody else. 
And they said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I've just finished a book on Howard Thurman and Martin Luther King Jr. I'm working on uh, the sequel, and I'm trying to answer this question. Where did these great leaders come from? I know they did not arise out of a historical vacuum. What traditions were they a part of, and what kind of narratives uh, do I? And someone said, boy, you really need to talk with the Kellogg Foundation. We spoke with the Kellogg Foundation six months later. The Kellogg Foundation awarded me uh, more money than I've ever had in my life. And I studied uh, these traditions of Thurman and King for four years with some of the best scholars in the country, many names you know. Uh, and they helped me to uh, begin to excavate. It was almost a type of archaeology of knowledge for those who are interested in that sort of thing where we really looked at these narratives, especially the narratives of African-American women leaders. Um, by the time we finished, people like Anna Julia Cooper, Mariah Stewart, Ida B. Wells, and the Negro Women's Club movement, uh, I was at a whole different place in understanding how these great men had become leaders. It doesn't take a thing away from the great noble uh, leaders who are male in our traditions. But my God, to understand the intersectionality of race, class, and gender, and how they play out in the formation of leaders, for me at least, was a revelation. So this shows up for me in, in the book at various places. And if you read it, you'll see it. But that was one meeting. Then I went to another meeting. It's amazing when you're at these places called Vanderbilt, Harvard, you know, folks just show up. So I'm at this meeting with Clay Carson and uh, Jim Washington, who is now passed, and I said, boy, this is a great conference. Uh, I'm trying to publish a few obscure articles on Howard Thurman. And they said, boy, you need to talk with the Lilly Endowment. I did, and they gave me more money than I could ever imagine. And they're still giving me money. <laughs> if you're Baptist, you ought to say, praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, I, that's all I'm trying to tell you, and I began two projects. I'm, I left Harvard immediately uh, when uh, I, I got my money because I wanted to keep it. And I went to Colgate <laughs> Rochester. <laughs> I went to Colgate Rochester Divinity School as dean of the program of Black Church Studies. And there for, uh, from 1991 through 1998, uh, there were two projects working simultaneously. One was the project which was entitled The Development of Ethical Leadership from Black Church Traditions. The second was a editorial documentary project on Howard Washington Thurman. And for those who don't know Thurman, uh, I won't bore you with fine details, but uh, if you've not bumped into the mind and spirit of Howard Thurman, you probably have missed a wonderful, wonderful, deep experience that, that can keep you on the journey and maybe keep you sane. Um, after the completion of these two projects, I started uh, writing and moving into different circles. And uh, I received a call out of the blue from Morehouse College. They had a new president named Walter E. Massey. And he asked me to come and develop a leadership center for him. He said, Morehouse is the place where Thurman and King found their nurturing, also Maynard Jackson, and he went on and on and on, David Satcher. And I said, well, you don't have to convince me. I do know a little about this tradition. So in 1998, I began at work in earnest at Morehouse, and now we have what we call the preeminent uh, Center for the Development of Ethical Leadership, uh, three broad areas of education, research, and training. Uh, under our education area, we have a leadership studies minor, which is growing uh, at incredible speed, soon to be a major in the college, uh, full faculty now. We have um, several endowed lectures, and I was sharing at the table, we've had everyone from um, our good friends like Michael Eric Dyson to Warren Buffett uh, show up for these lectures. It's just been a wonderful ride. Um, and we also have public lectures where we invite people like Bill to come in and just talk about his practice. We're very interested in the narrative and how you arrive at your practice. And uh, we work with scholars in residence on the research. We at times have as many as three scholars in residence. 
uh, serving both as uh, intellectual resources, theoretical uh, resources for the discourse around leadership. Last year, for instance, we had Clay Carson from the King Papers, uh, Jochen Free from Salzburg Global Seminars talking about global citizenship, and um, our own scholar in residence, Preston King uh, from the UK. We also have a large area of training where we develop programs uh, locally, nationally, and globally. We are in uh, a new relationship with Leeds Global, work closely with the Oprah Winfrey Foundation, and so on. Please go to the website. All of that happened because I, 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 I bumped into myself. And the big point was that I had to remember my story. Um, I'm through with the first thing I wanted to tell you. That's the brief history. The second thing I wanted to tell you was a little bit about how this model came to be. And what we say to uh, especially emerging leaders in places like Morehouse, a uh, week before last I was at Wiley College, a week before that I was at Garrett Theological Seminary, a week before that I was at Boston University. And the two things I say over and over again, ethical leaders are leaders who remember, retell, and relive the story. They remember, retell, and relive the story. If you're a theoretical person, as these fine students are here, I know what you're thinking deeply. I can smell your brains from here. Uh, to, to, to remember, just think of a, of a big triangle, and on one side is memory, on the other side is vision, and under, uh, at the bottom is mission. Memory, vision, mission. Or if you want to be very simple, think of past, future, present. And everybody knows by now who is paying attention that leaders must be present. But to be present, I don't think you can erase memory. I think erasure of memory may be one of the greatest challenges for leadership in the 21st century. Uh, in our own communities, African American communities especially, and historically marginalized communities, we have at least two or three generations of young people who've arrived on the stage of history without a script. Uh, they don't know their lines. I'm not angry at them. It's not their fault, but they arrive in public space as unscripted actors, anxious stutterers in word and deed. And when you don't know your line or lines or have any idea of what the lines ought to be, you become highly improvisational. And we do have leaders who do that very well in public space, often without substance and often without any great reward. In fact, the tendency sometimes is to be very counterproductive and even destructive. So memory becomes very important. And we ask, I teach a seminar, for instance, at Morehouse on ethical leadership from African-American moral traditions. I, I tell these young men who are going to lead something. When you come to Morehouse College, you're going to lead something. That's why you came. But we're interested in how they lead. And uh, I tell them often, if, 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 if there's no real connection to this narrative which precedes you, uh, you'll probably do some very interesting things in your leadership role. So memory becomes important. And though I work out of the particularity of African-American moral traditions, I think this has universal meaning, intent. Uh, I know it works in other places. One of the things that works very well for theological students, for instance, is just to come to grips with their own story in terms of the very diverse theological traditions that meld into what you think is yours. I told the guys last night, I said, you know, I was a white evangelical Christian until I got saved. <laughs> it, it, it was, I mean, I was, man, I really knew the four spiritual laws and I'd memorized most of the Bible and I could beat you, you know, in cross-referencing uh, and, and I could preach you in the hell. I had it all down pat. But li little did I know that those, uh, that tradition was also part of some other kinds of traditions that were far more complex and had perhaps more relevance for me if I best understood how they came to be. Retelling your story, that's kind of on the vision side, is when you really begin to reframe your story within the context of larger social historical narratives. 
how do I reframe my story? If I remember my story, and later ask me if we have time, I'm just trying to be aware of your time because I want to talk to you. Uh, tell, ask me to tell you about Isis and Osiris, and I'll tell you what the remembering is about. But if you can reframe the story or retell your story, that is with the with, with, with your orientation of vision. Peter Senge always talks about the idea of vision and reality and the tension which exists between vision and reality. And in this place of ambiguity and tension, he says is where the work of real creativity is possible. So if one has a vision of oneself, within an organization, of course, but always in light of a certain kind of cultural ethos, one has opportunity to struggle uh, with some very, very deep challenges and issues, which we normally don't pay much attention to as leaders. Um, I think Barack Obama is the best thing since, uh, what, mother's milk? But I think his thoroughgoing pragmatism just runs into all kind of struggles. And uh, if you follow closely some of his memoirs and memories of his father, you begin to see why this man has learned uh, how to be so pragmatic and how to safely negotiate the traffic at the intersection. Uh, it's part of his leadership makeup. Brilliant, but challenged right now. And let us all pray that uh, we get beyond this present impasse. But, but vision, retelling, reframing the story. When there is a, uh, a tension between memory and vision, remembering and retelling, one has an opportunity to come into the present in terms of formulating mission. That's just a construct. We'll be doing that this afternoon, by the way. That'll be the workshop. We'll be trying to help leaders move to a place where they begin to rethink mission. Who am I really? What do I really want? <laughs> And, and then how do I get what I want? Three basic questions. The model. The model, believe it or not, is the same uh, idea. That's really a triangle there. Uh, but it becomes a pyramid. And when I make it dance, it, it's really impressive. Uh, we can't do it real well today, but we, you can see some of it, you know. It, it dances because it's interactive. I began with character, civility, and community, but I'm really beginning with self, society, and spirit. Or if you want to talk about personal, public, and I couldn't get the P to illiterate, Ill illiterate, <laughs> pietas, pietas, you know. But anyway, the idea of spirit is always, I think most models of leadership uh, fail miserably at this third dimension that we sometimes call spirit. And spirit for me has everything to do with elevation of consciousness, stimulation of consciousness. Uh, it, it ought to be religious if you are religious, but it won't be re limited to religion if you take it very seriously. It's about becoming aware not only of one's external environments, but also the deeper inner environments where most of us live and not totally aware. I'll let the psychologists here help you with that. There is a great story, though. You heard the story about uh, Dr. Smith. You know, he was visiting his patients, and um, one patient he approached, and he said, my name is Dr. Smith. I'm new here. Uh, what's your name? The guy gave him his name. Went to another guy who was walking back and forth, had his hand in his vest, rather nervous. And he said, uh, my name is Dr. Smith. What is your name? He said, my name is Napoleon. He said, really? Who told you that? He said, God. And the guy in the back said, no, I didn't. <laughs> said, you know, it, there are always very deep things going on in subterranean wells, and this is true for leaders. And uh, the, these affective dimensions, as we call them, have uh, incredible impact on cognition and behavior. One does not escape the deeper issues that, that are internal. And I try to work on that in the book. So under self, I place character. And I don't mean that just simply as some discrete psychological entity. But I'm more interested in the personal development of the leader, especially emerging leaders. And under character, we're really asking uh, three basic questions. Uh, questions of identity, question of 
purpose, which is a loaded term. You might call it direction. I like purpose. And a uh, question of method. Who am I? What do I want? And how do I get what I want? Is a very important piece because it raises the kind of moral, ethical issues. Under civility, it's more psychosocial. And I'm interested here, uh, not just in etiquette as in manners at the table. Uh, I never figured that out anyway. But I'm interested in the etiquette of social systems, uh, political systems. In fact, democracy, I think, without civility is an impossible project. We may have all kinds of rules and penalties associated with those rules, but the rules uh, proliferate ad nauseum unless there is some deeper understanding of civility and what constitutes our lives together. For me, this is a significant ethical issue that haunts us now but will haunt us even more in a global world. And the sooner we figure this out, um, maybe the safer we'll be on the planet. I'm not sure we're doing very, very well with civility. Uh, so I spent a lot of time there. I don't know if there's time to interrupt, but just a quick question. Can someone confront someone else and still be civil? Uh, let me come right back to it, because I'm wrapping up right now. And the, the last piece, of course, is community which I, I place on the spiritual side, which is really an ideal. It's what we reach for and uh, we pray does come to pass. Can someone confront another person? And I, I would think that if you don't confront the other, the other might not know you exist some days. I think democracy at its best is a contentious debate about the goods and services and ideals that constitute our being together. And uh, it demands confrontation. But it does not give us the right or the prerogative to maim, injure, and kill someone because we disagree with them. Uh, the hotbed issues like abortion, politics, this is the place where you just had a major convention. You know, there, are ways to, uh, there are ways to exist, uh, I think, civilly without destroying each other. And we've already gone past that very delicate line, I think, in our own culture, where it's becoming frightening. And we see it play out most, uh, I think, in, in the behaviors of our youth, especially very vulnerable, marginalized youth. They don't know just that you should restrain, restrain yourself when you get angry. They see basketball players just take folks down. Or when they pick, well, you, you got it. You're right. I'm through talking. I thought I would talk that way and not bore you because the greatest uh, sin in the world, Ed, is to bore people. How did you convert from a white evangelist? Uh, I think Jesus saved me. <laughs> He's, uh, he saw me suffering there. <laughs> All of these dual identities, confused, double consciousness. Yeah, uh, yeah seriously, Graham and I uh, share some common friends and territory. I owe so much to some of the institutions uh, that really helped me in a lot of ways. So uh, I'm grateful to people who are part of the nurturing and the formation. But ideologically, it, it was so dangerous because I had to go back to my community and um, that really wasn't working. You know, the preacher and the deacon were praying one day. Along came a bear coming down the way. The preacher told the deacon to say a prayer. He said, Lord, a prayer won't kill this bear. We got to run for it. <laughs> and, and some of the communities I, I was working in and came out of, there were a lot of bears. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, the basic theological discourse of many of those communities didn't allow for a real struggle with the bear. So it's been a while. Yeah, I'm here now to stop talking and let you talk. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate uh, what you shared with us. And I want to ask a question about uh, the way in which you, at the very beginning, uh, spoke to the importance of women in the nurture mm -hmm. of many of these luminary figures who we always look to. And then as you talked about the line of, of, of voices mm -hmm. that you've been able to bring 
into the Senate of Morehouse. How have you been able to value and incorporate the voices of those women whose names they're often just don't bring up? Yeah, I'm in Morehouse and, College, right. Yeah. <laughs> We really try to make sure, well, we have a, our advantage at Morehouse is that we have a sister college, Spelman, which is uh, an incredible school in its own right, has its own tradition. And there's a lot of intercourse, social intercourse, between <laughs> Spelman and, and Morehouse. And, uh, yeah. and uh, the, boy, that was Freudian. Um, and the point, the point is that we do have these regular exchanges and cross-referencing. But we make, we're very intentional about inviting, uh, for instance, women who are lecturers, uh, whether it's the new CEO of Xerox or uh, Ruth Simmons. It does have a long list of women being present for major uh, lectures and especially for discourse, not just practice, but to show women in roles as really thinking about leadership. Uh, another element, though, we take seriously is the whole issue of diversity and difference. Uh, I teach a seminar, as I told you, on ethical leadership and African-American moral traditions, and we, we look at many of these women of the 19th century right off the bat, from Sojourner Truth, but also to names that people don't really recognize. Then we talk about the men who uh, were either transsexual, transgender, because Morehouse has a significant gay population. I don't think it should be a secret. Where you have all of the men, uh, you have a lot of other kinds of men, and they have to live together. And that's not always easy. Uh, it's not paradise. Uh, but part of the intellectual discourse has to interrogate some of the assumptions we bring uh, to our role as leaders and the ways in which uh, many of the issues, especially related to difference, play out. This area here, Ed, under recognition, is one of the major uh, uh, pieces we work with. When you uh, get a chance to look at the book, I'm not trying to sell it if you borrow it from someone. Uh, recognition is a major challenge for leaders in public space because, Michelle, it's important that your look, the look that you have at me, you're looking at me, is not a look of disgust. Uh, but it's a look of, of invitation. Uh, Sartre says, hell is other people because your look can kill me. Uh, how do we find ways to move beyond uh, the, the kind of nagging presence of the look of the other? Uh, for people who are challenged already within a culture, they learn to mask very effectively and to mirror the other, which is very damaging. So recognition, Notice that all of these are colored coded when you, when you are reading. Integrity is related to recognition. And um, if one has not dealt with a sense of wholeness, I use Thurman's definition for integrity. A sense of wholeness, something that is indivisible. Parker Palmer talks about it as the hidden wholeness. All of the mystics like this idea that there's something way down there that is whole. Victor Anderson wouldn't like all that. That's not pragmatist enough, by the way. But, but a hidden wholeness, integrity for me grows out of this deep place where there's a, a deep spiritual uh, uh, sense of self. That's kind of loose language, but that's my point. It's a deep sense of wholeness where there's something indivisible. I often use the language of integer. Remember integer in math? I ask students often, I say, what is a prime number? And the really bright students say, oh, sure, Dr. Fluker, it's what? A prime number. Anybody here remember? Uh, or what, what, what's the other way of talking about a whole number? <laughs> it's a number which can only be divided by itself. And it's really indivisible. So integer integrity really has its roots in this kind of language. And to find this deep space, I think, is part of the personal project for leadership. And for me, that's emphatically spiritual. Now, building off of that, mm -hmm. I guess some of us earlier you talked about a lot of folks not knowing what script is like. At Morehouse, how are you trying to help students to become less fragmented or familiar with spiritual ideas, the vocation of ethics, and the ways that it is that critical for them in moving forward and understanding their role in the life and how to take care of themselves? 
the center is part of a larger uh, curriculum, and we've revised curriculum. And we have a new president, by the way, Robert Michael Franklin. We have a black male institute uh, where we, we work on it on the theoretical side, but we've also done major revisions in curriculum. For instance, under my shop, we have an entire class just on spirituality, ethics, and leadership, uh, where we help them understand it theoretically. But under my training, we, uh, we're actually involved in programs that are highly experiential. So we do a lot of storytelling, but then we ritualize the stories. Uh, Plato's allegory of the cave for us is called the cave of the heart. And where in the cave of the heart, one recognizes his or her responsibility not just to be enlightened, to leave the cave, but to return. And uh, a great challenge for black elites, as elites are in all societies, uh, is to return to the horror of the cave. And this is really part of what we call a ritual uh, that takes place over a seven-day period of time, learning how to return so that we stimulate consciousness through means of the aesthetic. Talk about aesthetic triggers. Uh, people learn quicker when they are feeling it. <laughs> you know, but the kind of uh, heavy theoretical things, uh, I think, ought to come in tandem with experiential learning. So there's experience, reflection, the abstract principles we come up with, and then testing those principles in a new situation, constantly driving that. We've been successful. We've had at least two Rhodes Scholars who've come through the leadership program. Uh, very successful. And we've had some ma major learnings. Uh, not everybody is interested in going into the cave of the heart. And uh, I've learned that when you go into the cave of the heart, you better have a lot of clinical people around. Because many of the young people with whom we work bring a lot of pain and a lot of misery. And to touch the heart, is a very, very delicate operation. That, what you're speaking about is very important, it seems to me, in working with individuals who have been victims of trauma and all kinds, emotional trauma takes a lot, there can be all kinds of, of pain that they are carrying with them. And so working with individuals who come from that kind of history allowing them to find their own choice around self-respect, which is many people who react out of violence to not violent behavior or act, act, acting from their own shame and lack of ability to feel that they've been respected or their self has been honored in their past experiences. And so that seems to be very basic, is that in our communication with individuals who may disagree with, may have mm -hmm. totally different traditions. I mean, certainly mm -hmm. the Christian tradition is one of them, mm -hmm. but there are all kinds of different religious traditions that also have to be respected and honored and recognized. And uh, so many wars and violence have been done in the name of all of our mm -hmm. religions, of mm -hmm. course. But trying to communicate in ways with individuals who differ vastly, that you have that have totally different perspectives, but also then come from a place, place of pain, makes for very complex leadership challenges, or just even individual communication. Let, let me give you two examples uh, of, of what I mean. Um, one is a, a major university uh, here in the country where I've uh, worked with students. These were graduate students and um, very diverse group, uh, ethnically, religiously, very diverse group. And one common theme shows up uh, when they remember their stories. You've called it trauma. I'm going to give it even more specific. Uh, sexual abuse is real in our culture. It's, it's really real. And the incredible pain that individuals carry, um, it doesn't go away when you become a leader. <laughs> In fact, leadership positions uh, can actually stimulate or exacerbate some of those, those challenges. 
That's here in this country, major university. South Africa. Um, for the State Department, we conducted training for South African emerging leaders. I had no idea what uh, many of these young people, and young for them is a little different for us. It, during that period, went up to 40. But what m some of these young people had experienced during apartheid and the grief, and, and, and that's why I say sometimes returning to the horror of the cave uh, is more than a notion. I've always used clinical people since early days we started testing this model in, in quote unquote urban centers. I, but um, if you're going to open people up, you darn better have some kind of strategy in place to continue the care. Um, and that first experience in South Africa convinced me that that's something that I will never do again unless I really already have the structures in place for people to be cared for. Um, we all know these experiences too well for ourselves. Uh, but it's not until we have a community of discourse and practice where we can join one another. And this is leadership in the 21st century. It's not about the solitary, discreet individual leader who is authority. I think we've all figured that out by now, right? Preachers especially, I work with preachers. Preachers, I'm telling you, it won't, it won't be that way. You can't just, you're not the prophet by yourself. <laughs> you know, you know, just, just give it up now. It's about a community of discourse and practice where we strengthen one another along the way. Functionally, people play roles, yes, uh, but nothing is fixed, James Baldwin says, forever and ever. Nothing is fixed. Uh, and so it is true with, with, with leadership. I, I tell a story that my daddy used to tell about uh, the, the two snakes that got caught in the barn. One snake had one head with two eyes. The other snake had 10 heads with 20 eyes. The barn caught on fire. My daddy would always say, which snake is going to get out of the barn? And he had his answer, of course, right? And so do you, right? Which snake gets out of the barn? See, that's what I think we need to think about in the 21st century. I don't think it will ever be just one head that gets out of the barn. And the barn is on fire. How do we develop skills of collaboration, communi strategic communication, uh, and the ability to listen to the other with empathy and respect? How do we do this? Uh, are some major questions. What if uh, the United States Congress could just Figure it out. The barn is on fire. And we're asking questions like, who, whose fault is it? And who's to blame? And looking for, yeah, uh, and, and serious uh, leadership in the 21st century is ethical. Uh, but ethics, again, covers a multitude of, of sins and errors. We, we really need to start thinking about collaborative strategies that help us to address some of the most pressing concerns in front of us. Graham, I'm ready to stop if you are trying to keep, be mindful of your time, or else I can go all morning. And I know you're a Canadian, and you're very nice, you were saying that, so you don't have to do it. You know, I've been in the U.S. for 20 years. <laughs> well, yeah, you know how to be mean then, I've right? <laughs> okay. No,
Well, I wish you were going to be at the workshop today because that's kind of what this is about. That was grandiloquent. It wasn't just eloquent. It was very, very well restated. Um, I think uh, when, when you say balance, you've named something that is fundamental. Um, I make a distinction in the book uh, between tradition and traditionalism. And I borrow a uh, definition from Edward Shields, a uh, great sociologist at one point from the University of Chicago. He talks about tradition as, as the hand of the gardener. You know, I, 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 I plant and I transplant. But when I transplant, it's fundamentally different in different contexts. And it's not so much the case that I take the essence. We love to use that language. No, but narrative is very funny. Uh, Toni Morrison talks about, am I going off too deep? You with me? Okay. Yeah. She talks about uh, narrative as willed creation. And she says, imagine a, a, a pride of cats all herded together and you throw a stone and they dash away from one another, but they come back together and they always come back together differently. She said the nature of narrative and composition is to will this together. So part of what the leader does with moving from tradition or more importantly, his or her story within the context of larger social historical narratives is to begin to imagine what is possible. This is why vision is vision, because one imagines what is possible. And to see oneself uh, becoming uh, is always going to be qualitatively different, uh, hopefully substantively new in coming together. And I think it's that kind of deep work that leaders must be engaged in, especially emerging leaders, and especially leaders uh, uh, from, from very young communities. In some ways, they have some advantages. Now, does that mean taking a history book and picking everybody out? Maybe. Not a bad idea. I'm still into that. But I'm more interested in memory than just history. Cultural memory. The long memory uh, that also has pathos, has something to do with being able to, to, to empathize with something which has preceded you, but is still very much a part of you. And for me, again, this is, this is spiritual. Uh, it's not simply a psychological investigation, unless you understand it that way. Something that moves me towards something that is much larger than myself and which cries out for mystery, for, 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 for a kind of understanding of mystery. For me, I have one section on reverence that uh, you might want to look at. I'd like for leaders to put reverence back in their vocabulary. Might save us. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Um, again, I just want to make sure I didn't bore you. I, I, my story growing up is I was always afraid I was boring people. You know, so I hope I hope this worked. And thanks again, Grant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't think you okay.